Hello, this is Drew Collins, Rector of St. Andrew's Anglican Church in Savannah, Georgia. Today is the 4th of September, and it is the 12th Sunday after Trinity, and I would invite you now to join me in praying the collect appointed for today. Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art wont to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Here beginneth the 31st verse of the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny his himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it and what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul for what command give in return for his soul for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the son of man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of of his father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Well, on the 2nd of May, of last year, I began serving as rector of St. Andrew's Church. It was a joyous day. It was a beautiful spring day. Uh, we had a good attendance, and uh, I had a warm reception, and on that day I was filled with excitement and anticipation about what God would do here. Uh, not what I would do, but what God would do, uh, and how I might be a part of it, along with the, the good people of this parish. That joy and that excitement was uh, quickly turned to horror, however, because uh, after the service, I went over to the rectory where I had left my beloved dog, B in the backyard and discovered that she had gotten out uh, through an opening, uh, a gate that I was not aware of in the fence. And she stayed gone for four and a half months. Uh, some of you watching this are aware of that. Some of you watching this, if you're members of St. Andrews, lived it. Uh, but she stayed gone four and a half months. And I'm pleased to report that she returned and is happy and healthy and not very far from me as I record this uh, right now, as a matter of fact. But my... Excitement, my good day, quickly turned to a very not-so-good day. It was, a, it was the best of both worlds, as it were. Uh, still was excited about St. Andrews. I'm still excited about being rector of St. Andrews. But it, at the same time, I was very concerned about my, about my friend, about my dog. Well, that kind of sums up the kind of day St. Peter was having. Now, you recall last week, Jesus asked who or the people said he was, and then who did they say he was, and Peter answered for the, uh, for the apostles, he said, you are the Christ. And Jesus, elsewhere in one of the parallel passages, commends Peter, and he says, you are my rock, you are Petros, you are the rock on which I will build my church. Now, I don't think the Roman Catholic interpretation of that is warranted, but certainly Peter was commended. 
And if things had just stopped there, it would have been a good day for St. Peter. But then you get to, to this account. Jesus, after that, began to, to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the scribes and be killed and after three days arise again. Now, he had announced his Messiahship and he had told them to tell no one, but now he tells them what is to come. And in 31 we read, he must suffer these things. Now, his, that, that must is not there because Jesus suffered under any kind of human compulsion. He was the, the sovereign Lord of the universe. He didn't have to do much of anything. I mean, in terms of a, a human being making him do anything. But... He did have to suffer death. He did have to give up his life. And that's because in Leviticus, when it's talking about the, the sacrifices, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life pointing to the necessity of Jesus' sacrifices, offering himself up on the cross for his, his people. Elsewhere, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus, as a part of his mission, as a part of why he came here as the Messiah, he had to he had to be offered up. He had to offer himself up on the cross. He had to shed his blood. And that's what he tells, uh, that's what he's telling his disciples here. Now that was not the Jewish expectation of the Messiah. The Jews expected that the Messiah would come as a king, as a shepherd, as a redeemer, and certainly Jesus did all of those things, but what they neglected to take note of, what the disciples were missing, was that he also must suffer. They had missed applying what Isaiah 52 and 53 and, and Psalm 22 and other passages that speak of the suffering of the suffering Messiah and the suffering servant. They had failed to apply that. And he was telling these things plainly, it reads here in the King James, it says, it says openly, this was an in-house conversation among Jesus and his close followers, among his apostles. <clears throat> and then we read that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now why did Peter do that? Peter could not comprehend what Jesus was saying. Jesus had had just revealed himself to be the Christ, the Messiah, the Chosen One. And Peter, with his finite mind, honestly could not comprehend that that Messiah would suffer. And so we read that he rebukes Jesus. He cannot believe it, so he rebukes our Lord. And he did so forcefully. The word that is used there is epitmo, epitmo, epitimo, excuse me, epitimo. It's the same word that is used to describe Jesus rebuking the demons. And as that is happening, Jesus turns and he sees his other disciples there. And then he rebukes Peter with the same force. In fact, he says, get behind me, Satan. The same thing he had said when he was tempted in the wilderness. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your, thing, your, your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
Peter and the disciples wanted a quick fix. As most all of us do at some time or another, they wanted a Messiah who was going to come in, who was going to overthrow the the Roman occupation under which they were living and set things aright. And they wanted it fairly suddenly. But Jesus says no. Your mind or your minds are on the things of man, not on the things of God. And then Jesus calls a crowd to him. This is no longer an in house discussion. A larger crowd comes to him along with his disciples, and he says to them, If anyone would deny himself and let him or if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus calls them to denial, for that is what following Jesus will entail. Denying oneself and taking up the cross. Now, that, of course, points to the way in which Jesus would die. But Jesus is here calling us as his disciples, to to live lives of sacrifice and self-denial as we seek to follow Jesus. And in the account from Luke of this, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Because that's really what discipleship is. It is daily following Jesus. Now there are some who have dramatic conversions and where they're genuine I give thanks for it. But that is not the end. That is the beginning. Even where there has been that dramatic conversion and some people don't have dramatic conversions as I've I've said before in preaching on the Gospel of Mark in fact Some come to Jesus very gradually. Others know not a time when they did not follow Jesus. But even for those who have the the dramatic conversions, living the Christian life is a day-in and day-out process. It's something... That may be begun that is begun at that point, but will not end until our life on earth is over, and we're promoted to the church triumphant. And in expanding upon this, Jesus addresses the cost of discipleship. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. Nothing that we can be deprived of in this life for Jesus' sake can compare to the glory that will be revealed in the life which is to come. He says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to forfeit his soul? The answer, of course, is nothing. One, one can gain the whole world, but if they've lost their soul, ultimately they die a pit- pitiable death. What can man give in return for his soul? The answer, of course, is nothing. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful, sinful generation... Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We need to confess Christ in this life because the day will come when we stand before him. We do not want him to be ashamed to confess us and to acknowledge us as his own in that life. And 
Then he says to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they, they sing the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, that's a somewhat confusing sta- sentence. Because what exactly is he referring to? Exactly what event does our Lord have in mind here? Well, there are some who say the transfiguration. The only problem with that was only two other humans saw the transfiguration. And given its close proximity, only a week later, Uh, to this event, it's doubtful that very many people had died, so almost everyone who heard him would have been living at that time. Some have suggested it is his resurrection, but again, that's not that far off. Or Pentecost. Those are various suggestions, and no one can be dogmatic about exactly what they are. I would suggest that he is instead referring to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that time when the Old Covenant passed away, because Christ, then the temple was no more needed, because Jesus Christ had given himself on the altar a propitiation once and for all for our sins. So we are called to live lives of sacrifice, of devotion, of daily taking up our cross and following Jesus. And there are times where that will be hard and there are times where that will be difficult and there will be times when that is a struggle but we can know that it is all worth it. And we can also know that when we do so, we're doing so in obedience to him and to his commandments. Yes, Christ was and is. Jesus was and is the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen and anointed one who loved us so much that when the time came, he gave himself up on on the cross so that we who were alienated, estranged, and afar off from him might be reconciled and forgiven and adopted into the family of God. So let us take up our crosses daily. Let us follow him with devotion. And let us give thanks for the great love that was shown to us. In his, in his sacrifice, in his life, his death, and his resurrection. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen.